Hello, I'm Father Mitch Paqua, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. Tonight, we'll talk about a three-year initiative that begins this Sunday. It seeks to rekindle devotion to the Holy Eucharist in the United States, culminating in a National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis in the year 2024. This will be the first of its kind in the United States in nearly 50 years. But before we do that, we want to talk briefly with the EWTN's Peter Gagnon about some specials that are coming up among EWTN live events and programs. Peter, what live events and programs do you have for us? Well, as indicated with tonight's topic, this Sunday we kick off, um, it's Corpus Christi. So it's really a highlight of, of the year for us. Uh, mm -hmm. We do the uh, Mass from up in Hanchville with the Friars, mm -hmm. and then the beautiful procession with the Holy Eucharist through mm -hmm. the grounds of the Most Blessed Sacrament Shrine. Yes. And um, it really is very, uh, very moving event. We really want to focus on our Lord's true presence and honoring Him with not just a Mass, but with this special procession. So we do that every year from up there in Hansville, and so people can um, tune in for that beginning this Sunday. Now we do that at 10 a.m. Eastern, so we um, don't have our normal 8 a.m. Mass from here. This kind of takes the place of that, so okay. people should tune into that. Secondly, following that is the World Meeting of Families. So every three years, the church has an event uh, where they bring uh, families from around the world together to focus what are the issues facing families, how can we support families mm -hmm. in the role, parents, children, etc. Um, actually, this year it's been four years. The last one was in Dublin in 2018. Right. And um, this year is in Rome. Um, COVID prevented it from happening last year. Uh, and so, but EW10 will be on the ground there with live coverage of all the events, um, the Festival of Families. We're going to have a special preview show. There's talks every day, there's mass, um, and there's um, special panels. And so we'll be live on the ground with um, Catherine Hadro and, and uh, Dr. Matthew Bunsen and Father uh, Petrie. They're going to be hosting our coverage of that. So people yes. can tune in. It starts on Tuesday with a special preview show, and then Wednesday through Sunday, events with the Holy Father on, on Saturday night and on um, Sunday. And then finally, at the end of the month, we have a brand new um, documentary that we put together with the Archdiocese of San Francisco called um, In Search of America's Catholic Founders. So we're looking at um, the first episode is Junipero Serra. And mm -hmm. so, you know, he's been really maligned lately. And, yes. um, and so we got together and we did a, a documentary working with Archbishop Corleon is in it. And it's a really beautiful documentary. Um, telling more insights into who he was, what he did, and how it really has um, affected uh, the church in the United States. Yeah. So that will air at the end of June and air actually into um, the 4th of July weekend with several airs. So people should go to EWTN.com and find information about all these special programs. Great. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. We'll be back in a couple minutes with tonight's guest, so please stay with us. Welcome back. Now, we have a guest tonight who is passionate about helping Catholics experience a deeper renewal of faith that propels them out to evangelize the communities they live in. He is the founder and president of Alto Catholic Institute and Revive Parishes. But now he's working very closely with the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops to help lead a three-year program of national and personal revival of devotion to the Eucharist, which will include a National Eucharistic Congress that's going to take place in Indianapolis in 2024. 
So here to tell us more about it, please welcome Tim Glemkowski. Tim, how you doing? I'm welcome. good, Father. How are you? Well, good to have you here. Yeah, good, good to, to be here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Now, this is a, a big effort that the bishops are taking on to evangelize our folks about the Eucharist. What is it that the bishops see that is motivating them to make this focus on reviving Eucharistic faith and devotion? Yeah, it's a good question. It's one we get a lot. You know, why now? Why this big mm -hmm. Eucharistic mm -hmm. revival? Um, and I think in many ways it's, you know, a response to God's invitation. I mm -hmm. think the bishops have heard uh, sort of God saying, you know, I, I want to renew, re, you know, revive my church through mm -hmm. an encounter with me in the Eucharist. And I think the reasons are few. I mean, we, we know that uh, from the statistics, <coughs> you know, a large percentage of Catholics, even many Catholics who are regularly practicing the faith, don't really believe or, or understand fully or, or, you know, haven't encountered the, the teaching of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, right? And I, th I think that's one element, you know, that folks don't understand that we believe Jesus is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's a change of substance of bread and wine. And a lot, of, what do you think on this? That it's more that they don't know what the faith of the church is or that they choose to disbelieve it? I think a little bit of both. You know, I've mm -hmm. talked to Catholics and some think that they agree with the church's teaching that it's a symbol. You know, they, they're, they're like, oh, I totally, you know, uh, agree and believe the church's teaching is just just mm -hmm. a symbol. I think others, you know, so maybe they haven't been exposed uh, mm -hmm. to the to the church's teaching. I think for others, it's just we live in a time where where uh, belief, where faith, where assent is a difficult premise, you mm -hmm. know, and so there's all kinds of obstacles. I think. Um, to belief that that need to be addressed in a fundamental way too, and and for them, even if they've maybe been presented the teaching, maybe it hasn't been in a systematic or compelling way, or or maybe they they, they struggle and for some reason to to fully accept it. But I think there's a, a little bit of each. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One one of the other things too that I this has been part of my own thinking. We talked about this in the earlier program um, when we talked about Eucharistic miracles uh, recently. And one of the other things, too, I wonder, is that liturgy has been sloppily celebrated or sometimes politicized to pr push agenda. I think a good deal of that has had an effect on what people believe, that it doesn't have the solemnity it once did. And that seems to be another factor. Yeah, I think we show our love for, for Jesus in how we worship, right? And there's that Catholic theological principle, you know, lex orandi, lex credendi, the law of prayer is the law of belief, you know? And I think mm -hmm. that uh, describes, too, how our, our liturgy, you know, kind of flowers into theology. But I think it also is about, you know, how our, our stance is in worship. And I think you're right. We, we say something about uh, what we think is happening at the Mass. Um, by what so they, they've talked about a little bit one of the, the, the goals of this Eucharistic revival um, is a reflection on what, what they refer to as the Ars Celebrandi, right? the art of celebrating the liturgy and, and calling all of us sort of back to a, um, a, a greater devotion there and, and, and love in those, those kind of key liturgical moments. Yeah. Well, and certainly, you know, I've started seminary back in 1963 when I served uh, Mass Back in the 50s and 60s, it was in Latin. Um, a lot of it was not even heard by the congregation because it was the priest and the servers back and forth. A lot of it was not understood because it was in Latin, all of it. But there was also a strong sense of attentiveness to uh, at least be prayerful. And that seems to have slipped a bit as well. It's more of a focus on us as a community rather than a focus on God's presence uh, at, at the Eucharist. Yeah, the vertical relationship to God confects the horizontal relationship of communion in the church, right? And I remember when I was home from college, I would go to daily mass. There was a noon mass at a, a local abbey. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. it was in the vernacular, but very, very peaceful and very, very still. And, and uh, those moments stand out to me as these moments of like real reverence that I think were, were challenging to me. I think for, for the, the more I encountered and saw, you know, priests who really, you know, believed and, and loved what was happening on that altar and had that sort 
sort of like um, uh, reverence for it, it's very challenging, you know, from the pews, from the perspective of the pews, you do, you sort of notice, you know, and mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, that, that, that art of celebration, I think, is, is so mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, one of the other questions is, is this primarily a celebration of the community expressing itself or is this worship of God so that we're focusing? I, I don't think you can or you should eradicate either side, but where is the focus? And that's, I think, been another tension that took attention away from the true presence of Christ and focused on the presence of us. Uh, I think that shows up in the hymns. We are building the body of Christ. We are the light of the world. We are this. We are the, it becomes focused on us too much and not on how great thou art. Interesting. Yeah, I think we live in a world where it's hard to remember that the supernatural or transcendent exists. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm too tied to my phone. And, you know, I think we're all sort of busy and, yeah. you know, rushing from thing to thing. And I, I remember it was in high school, toward the end of my high school, where I grew up in a Catholic family. I think we're both yeah, Chicagoans, you know, right. or I'm from the suburbs, but, uh, you know, kind of a culturally Catholic family. And my parents certainly were very devout, but myself didn't recognize the truth of it till toward the end of college when at a youth conference, I had this encounter with Jesus in adoration there. And, and I think the thing that struck me in that moment is God is real. And like, he's here, you know, he's, yeah. he's present. Uh, he's not just you know, this nice idea or sort of out there somewhere and maybe kind of like benignly, you know, mm -hmm. disinterested in mm -hmm. what we're, what we're doing down here, but he's like come close and it really challenged me about how I was living at the time. And I think the same thing can happen in the liturgy, right? Where if we, yeah. if we remember yeah. God's here, he's close, like he is almighty God, but he's come right here. Um, there's a, there's, that can be sort of, you know, you're gripping your arm, your the, the seats of your chair a little bit more. And and I don't want to come across as thinking this is a problem for the laity because they just don't know. No, it's been a problem for the clergy too. Hmm. Sometimes I don't think we have had that focus that when, when I say this is my body, you know, I'm, I'm saying this in the person of Christ so that the body of Christ can be present. And the same with the chalice. I say the words as the chalice of my blood. And it's so that I say those words of Christ so that Christ can become present sacramentally mm. right then and there. Mm. And sometimes we clergy can get a little careless as well. Yeah, I remember after my after that conversion experience, I, I st my parents went to daily mass. So I was like, oh, if you want to do this, you got to go to daily mass. You know, there's yeah. like, that was all. So I remember I would go every morning. It was like this joy was filling. It is, it's one of those realities, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. if we if we fully saw what was happening there, we just wouldn't stop weeping ever, you yeah. know? And I think as a church, um, there's a lot to worry about right now. Like the world is hurting and there's a lot to be concerned about. And I think this is a call, a clarion call from God to sort of just like, remember that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm here. I'm, I'm with you. Like come back to the, the angel to the church at Ephesus in Revelation, right? Like, you know, I, I hold this against you. You've lost the love you had at first, you know? Right. And I think right. can we come back to that first love is really the heart of this revival. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's one of the, it sounds like the fruit of your own meditation before the Blessed Sacrament is to deepen your love of Christ, mm. that you get to know Christ more, you love him more. Um, th that's one of the goals, as well as, you know, letting our Lord challenge us yeah. in the liturgy. Right. When you hear the gospel, it ought to be a challenge to each of us in so many levels. Yeah, I think we, we'd all love or maybe prefer sometimes a God who sort of confer, can, confirms all of our wishes and conforms to all of our yeah. you know thoughts and ideas and desires. And I think that's the beauty of Catholicism is like the kind of almost um, scandalous closeness of God. It, it is, it should, it should sort of, um, that awe and wonder um, should make us say, you know, how do I, and then the beauty is the grace is right there, right? In the sacrament, the grace to um, sort of change us and when our, when our hearts are open and repentant and desiring of that, you know, we start with the penitential mm -hmm. rite, right? Like mm -hmm. it's this whole action is about like, you are Lord and I am not, 
Mm -hmm. And I would like you to change me and make me more like you. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it should challenge us. It shouldn't be this thing we just sort of go through the motions and kind of come out the other side and go about our lives again. Yeah. It should be um, transformative. Well, the, and, and it was that way for the disciples. Our Lord would challenge them as much as he challenged the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He would call them out and saying to Peter, right after saying, you're the rock, and on this rock I'll build my church, a few, a few minutes later he calls him Satan for not being willing to accept that Christ had to die. So, you know, he, he would discomfort the, the self-comfortable. Yeah, yeah. In the Eucharist, Jesus has given himself utterly, and we're kind of called to do the same, right? I think that's one of the things I see as a, a challenge from the Lord to our church right now is sort of to say, like, you're the plan. You know, you're all these things going on in the world, like, you, I sent you, right? At Pentecost, the, the, the Father sends the Son. The Son sends the church to do the same thing the Son was sent to do, right? Mm -hmm. and for every time and in every place and in every season, right? In and out of season. And so I think, uh, you know, really, if we were as a church to, to fully adopt that stance of saying, like, what we have here, what we've been given uh, in the sacramental economy, in the faith, in our doctrine, in our moral teaching, and all the, the brilliance of Catholicism, like, is the, 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 the solution, right, to, to every pain and longing and question of the human heart, um, and, and to feel compelled by that out on mission. I think if we saw a church doing that more uh, readily and, and regularly, um, I think we would want, we would start to see the world look really differently. And I, and I feel that in my own life, right, as a sort of challenge or indictment mm -hmm. to say like, no, no, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And so if I pulled you close and if I turned the light on for you and showed you something different, uh, it wasn't just for your sake, it was, because I love you, but it, it was also for the sake of all those who uh, desperately need what Jesus Christ and his church alone yeah. can bring. Now, given that we, we've got uh, these these issues and there are a number of things that we can do uh, and that the church is doing. I think the new translation that's yeah, been a few years now, but this is a, an improved translation over the one that came out around 1970. And but you know some folks say, well, why do they keep changing? Well, it took a hundred years before the church got the mass from Greek to Latin in Rome. They celebrated Mass in Greek, and some people, like St. Hippolytus, were furious that they were doing it in Latin instead of Greek. We always did it in Greek. Oh, yeah. And so, so uh, around, and he, he's the author of Eucharistic Prayer Number Two. And, you know, so about, you know, this, the, the early third century, they started that process, but it took until the fourth century before it took its final form. So we're doing that, we're improving the translation as time goes on. And that helps, that really helps. But I also think there are other things that the bishops are trying to get us to do, and that's what you're you know, working on. What are some of the plans that the bishops have to call us and teach us more about the Eucharist. Yes, yeah, so I think what's unique about this initiative is it's a grassroots movement. You know, it's not just a top-down strategic plan. Mm -hmm. It's really the bishop saying, Good. here's the vision, here's the umbrella, here's where we see God saying go, and then in your in your you know local diocese and parishes and your apostolates and small groups and you know communities discern how God is so the the words we've been using is what we want to see is a movement of Catholics who are healed, converted formed, unified, and then sent on mission for the life of the world by a new, a, re a renewed encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. So under all those words, there's, you know, uh, renewed uh, experiences of Eucharistic adoration, Eucharistic procession, right? These great devotional moments. Mm -hmm. There's catechesis and resources, mm -hmm. for, you know, for small groups and discipleship and evangelization. There's outreach to the poor, right? The Eucharist sends us to the margins, charity, mm -hmm. you know, the flame of mm -hmm. charity wants to go outward. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly that, we talked about that, that uh, Ars Celebrandi piece, right? So there's, there's so many uh, things that sort of come under this umbrella of what is God wanting to do over the next three years uh, in, in order to um, uh, see a church, you know, revived and, mm -hmm. and, and, and all of those things. So um, it's going to be sort of a uh, remarkable, um, you know, few years here, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we're preparing for is a 2024 uh, Eucharistic Congress. 
There was one in Chicago back in 1926. Yeah. Uh, matter of fact, somebody gave me some of the books from that. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. And uh, significant parts of the seminary in Mundelein, Illinois, were built for that Congress. Right. They had a, a special little gondola where they brought the Eucharist across this lake, you know, and that was the Eucharistic procession on this very pretty lake. Wow. And then I think down the Soldier's Field, they uh, they had, they had a, a big maybe. celebration, big yeah. mass celebration. Yeah. And I think even maybe the train was built, you know, there's something, you know, in order to get the million people out, because it's, you know, it's north a good bit from the yeah, city and right. get people out there. So, yeah, we've had this tradition in the church, St. Paul had one, Philadelphia in 1976. Yeah, 1976, you uh, know, in our, you know, 200th uh, anniversary as a nation, they had one in Philadelphia where, you know, the declaration was signed. Right, and and uh, the keynotes, I love telling people this, the keynotes at that uh, 1976 uh, Euchar International Eucharistic Congress, that one was, were, uh, uh, you know, a, a cardinal from uh, Poland, Cardinal Karol Wojtyla, yeah. and then uh, Mother <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and he's he's there just uh, two years before he's elected pope. Right, it's remarkable. Yeah. yeah, so we're planning one in 2024. So we have to find, you know, either uh, you know uh, a future, a couple future saints, you know, for um, so I don't know if you, you know, but um, we. Uh, the, uh, if I meet some, I'll let you know. Okay, great, great. Yeah, noted. But it's going to be, so we wanna, what we want to do is this movement of Catholics, right, that's going to be springing up in all these local churches and, and movements and apostolates and orders and universities and everywhere over the next few years. There needs to be this moment where that movement can be gathered and can experience the revival sort of together, right? This very visible and public display of unity as a church um, to sort of say, this is it. This is where we want to stake. We want to build uh, our, ourselves and, and organize ourselves around the reality of Jesus's presence in the Eucharist. And so we're going to have a five-day Congress, uh, July 17th to 21st, 2024, mm -hmm. uh, in Indianapolis. We're hoping to get you know, at least 80,000 uh, Catholics there, if, if not more. And it's going to be a, a transformative. Hopefully gas prices will be down. <laughs> <laughs> it might help. That was one of the reasons we chose it is it's very central. You know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. very accessible, especially by driving. So, amen. Yeah, we, yeah. We'll, we'll pray for that. If anyone has any uh, spare prayers, we could use it for the gas prices. But, um, the, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a, a, a transformative moment. And then from there to send, you know, Eucharistic missionaries back out. You know, so sort of this you know, kind of come together and then, and then back out, back to mm -hmm. parishes and local communities. So mm -hmm. um, that's a, a big part of my job is helping to sort of plan and, and, and host and execute um, on that gathering. And then future ones to come. We want to reinaugurate these as moments in the life of the U.S. Mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. um, you know, every handful of years or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think that that will be good because, again, we talked about uh, so many Catholics don't know what the church teaches on the Eucharist. And sometimes in the surveys, they're, they're given options and they don't really know how to distinguish between, you know, consubstantiation, transubstantiation, and, you know, a couple other theories. And it's like, I don't know which one is which, you know, uh, that, that happens to a lot of folks. And so, uh, you know, this will be a time for, you know, deepening our understanding of the Eucharist. Uh, I think that's a very important, as we talked about last week, that, um, you know, nobody denied that, as a matter of fact, everybody taught that the Eucharist is truly the representation of Christ's sacrifice on the cross mm. and the real presence of Jesus. Mm. Both of those were taught by all the theologians until 1050. Hmm. One guy denied the real presence and even he came back. So this is, this is not some medieval construct. This is from the New Testament forward. And we have to be faithful to the teaching of Christ. I remember uh, to, to that point, you know, grew up in a Catholic family and went to a Catholic high school and um, I had my conversion and I was drawn to the Eucharist, just sort of experientially. It's like, I just want to be close to, to him, you know, and adoration and daily mass, right. like I reflected. Right. But it was interesting. It wasn't probably until about a year later after my conversion, I picked up at the time uh, Scott Hahn's Lamb's Supper. 
Oh yeah, and it blew my mind. You know, and then, and then years later, Brant Petrie's uh, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the scriptural basis for this doctrine um, of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, like it's, um, and the, the, the representation of, of, of Calvary, you know, Calvary um, there, it's uh, a little bit like looking back for me to be 19, 20 years old, to, for it to be the first time I, re I really heard any of that presented, right. reveals an issue. You know, to, to yeah. have been, I was in church every Sunday, if, if generally more, right? And hadn't really heard that um, explained in a clear way. Wow. I think it speaks to some of that, um, you know, catechetical crisis, which is a real component of that. So in these first two years leading up to the Congress, the first year, the diocesan year, a lot of it's gonna be focused on reaching leaders and, and you know, their personal renewal and, you know, presbyterates and parish leaders and diocesan leaders, and then uh, even preparing them for this really, you know, this year of mission to the pews, you know, because we know the problem, like if, if we're going to be the church sent on mission for the life of the world, um, then we ourselves need healing, conversion, formation, um, and, and unification. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we've got a lot of work to do. You know, it, it, it's mind boggling for the time when I grew up, Sister Saul, who prepared me for first communion uh, back in 1958, you know, made that so clear to us, mm. you know, and sometimes the st stories that she told us when we were uh, seven and eight years old uh, about the, uh, you know, St. Tarsicius who died protecting the Eucharist, you know, as a little boy in, in ancient Rome. And other stories confirmed what she was teaching. This was just so much part of the way that we learned and, and knew uh, the faith, and that that's been neglected is, you know, uh, horrendous. Uh, I think people will have to stand before our Lord to answer, why didn't you teach my truth about the Eucharist? Yeah, it's really, I have a, a friend who's an evangelical pastor, yeah. you know, and, and he asked me, you know, would you ever, uh, you know, would you ever jump over? I was like, I couldn't, you know, I said, well, why? Like, well, the Eucharist you know, and confession, you know, like, yeah. and so much more, right? But mm -hmm. the first thing that sort of comes out of your mouth is like the Eucharist. This is what we have. Right. That, and, and, and the fact that that hasn't been, it's, it's very hard. If you really understand what's happening there, it's, it's very hard to walk away. And, and you're right. There's sort of a, there, it's heartbreaking, right? It's probably it a is. good word that it's, it's it very, um, it's sad to think, I, I think my own life, even my feeling a call, I went into college, I was a political science major. I wanted to just be, a, uh, not just be, but be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, and that was my plan in my life. And I felt God calling me to, to ministry, you know, as so I switched my major theology mm -hmm. and philosophy in order to sort of, I wanted, and part of it was. And, and by the way, so folks know, your wife probably won't let you be a priest, right? Uh, n you know, no, she would, <laughs> she might have some objections. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and our three, our three kids might have some questions. So uh, yeah, this yeah, is very yeah. much so called to the lay state and a mission, but. Right. Uh, and that's why I bring that up. Yeah. You're called to this mission uh, in the lay state. You know, you're yeah. a layman. Right. This is not only for the clergy and the religious. Yeah. This is for every Catholic. Yeah, and for me, it's my profession, but we try to be really intentional as a family too about not letting mission be just that for us. It's like, mm -hmm. who are we also in terms of our neighbors, our neighborhood, <laughs> our other relations? Like, this can't just be dad's job. This has to be something we live, that, that pursuit of holiness as a family and mission as a family has to be just how we think about our lives. That's the point of it all. Right. And um, I think for me, it, it was that part of that call was almost thinking back to, you know, some of my buddies from the football team in high school and thinking, same parishes, same good Catholic families. I felt like the, you know, God had sort of reached into my life and turned that light on for me. Um, and almost thinking this source of joy that I've now encountered, how could I not, how could I withhold that for people? Like, how could I not want to just, um, but it's heartbreaking to think that they had spent so much time in churches, in parishes, and not really been able to encounter Jesus personally in the Eucharist yeah. the way I had. I think, the, a very important element in that is when anybody receives a special grace, and you, you're given a special grace, you know, uh, of a uh, very distinctive kind of conversion. I mean, you're a Catholic, but this deepening, and that's a special grace that you received. 
when God gives that to somebody, it's not because, oh, I want that person to be sort of special. I'll, it'll be like a, a, a nice little knickknack up in my heavenly you know, bureau or something. No, it's so that you can be that missionary. That's why he gives us these graces so we can use that and be motivated to go out. I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm still, you know, it's every day, right? Just trying to follow, you know, like uh, every day I feel like I have to come back to, to God and, and, and repent and uh, ask to be brought closer and to be changed and then <laughs> to love better, to love more adequately, right? Love of God and love of neighbor, you know, there's, mm -hmm. it really is uh, reducible to that in some ways. And so I think that's also sort of what's happening in this Eucharistic revival is like a communal act as a church uh, to sort of say, we want to love you more and we want to love others more. And can you help us do that? Right. Because that's we're, we're not Pelagians. Right. We don't do this on our own. We no. have to. Uh, yeah. So the folks understand Pelagius. Yeah. Was a, a theologian from Ireland or England. We don't know for sure. Um, but he taught that you basically, you know, do it by your own efforts. You save yourself by your own efforts. Yep. yep. And that was declared heresy. Right. Bootstrap sanctification, right? right? You can just sort of try your way into this. And um, so that's... I or think, earn your way. You do it by your own merits. Yeah. That was heresy. Right, right. And even semi-Pelagianism, right? That, well, the first decision's mine, and then God sort of comes. It's like, no, even that, even the grace to turn toward him is itself a grace. And so I think we have a chance here. I, I really do think, I, and I might be wrong, you know, but I really do think God is saying to his church, I, I'm, I'm doing something new, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. You know, now it springs forth, and it's sort of like, are we going to respond in that grassroots way to this, or are we going to wait for somebody to give us the plan? It's like, no, you are the plan, you yeah. know, like your, right. your, your conversion, your holiness, and, and those to whom he's sending you, like, if, if we want to see a church healed and a world transformed, um, it's going to be through, uh, that's been God's plan throughout history. It's always been in the lives of individual people who just surrender to God and he does remarkable things, right? Yeah. This, this, you know, this whole place is an example of that. Yeah, you know? very much so. Yeah. We have to take a little break, Great. but we're going to come back with your questions and your comments. So please stay with us. All right, uh, we are talking about the Eucharistic revival that we are seeking to develop and be part of in our Catholic faith. And if you want to get more information about what's happening, when it's happening, and what you do, there is a website, eucharisticrevival.org. eucharisticrevival.org. Org. Okay. All right. You ready for some questions? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Let's start off with Mabel, who is in the great state of Mississippi. Mabel, what can we do for you? I'm watching your program, and you talk about the Eucharist, and I'm wondering in the Catholic Church if you really believe it's the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, or is it symbolic? I've always gone back to John chapter six mm -hmm. and Jesus, after feeding the 5,000 mm -hmm. says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you'll have no life within you. Mm -hmm. And he becomes increasingly clear in that teaching to the point that all of these people walk away. And I think uh, and, he, and disciples, disciples, even yeah, right. it says his disciples walked away because they couldn't take that teaching and they'd left. You know, they were following him. They're out in the, you know, this is, they had made decisions to be there. And they realized he was being clear. This is really going to be my body, blood, soul, and divinity. And thousands of people just leave, right? And he doesn't say, like, no, no, it's a parable, right? I'm, I'm also the vine. I didn't, you know, it's not literal, right? No, he turns to his apostles and says, will you leave me too? Like, this is it. 
this is, this is how I want to be with you always to the close of the age is, is truly present. Um, and I, I can't get around that when I think of yeah. uh, the, the, that he's very clear there in that chapter. Yeah, and Mabel, um, yeah, yeah, we do truly believe that it is the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ present there, not a symbol. Uh, that it's the substance of the bread is changed into the substance of Jesus Christ. And the reason we believe that is our Lord said, this is my body. You know, uh, this, you know, and he uses the word emphatically. So th does that help you, Mabel? Yes. All right. Yeah, it, it, something that may be helpful. We, again, we talked about this last week. But with the bread, the color of the bread, the makeup of the bread, uh, the weight and the taste, those are what we call the accidental qualities. There's something of it that is the bread and breadness as distinct from a cookie or distinct from a cake. It has the substance of being bread that it transcends. Sometimes, too, you have pumpernickel. If you go have a good bakery, not the stuff that's in the plastic package, but from a real good bakery, <laughs> but good rye bread, corn bread, things. But they're all bread. And what we understand is that it's not the accidents that change, the accidental qualities of weight, taste, color, etc., those don't change. They stay the same. But its essence of as bread is no longer there. We don't believe that it is bread. Martin Luther believed that it was bread and the body of Christ. But you can't be two substances at the same time, either you're one or the other. So the substance of bread is changed and becomes Jesus Christ uh, in his humanity. And the same thing with the wine. Wine has different accidents, different tastes, sweetness, dryness, color, all that. It's the wineness that changes into the blood of Christ. And it's not a symbol. Uh, in fact, Pope Paul, Pope St. Paul the Sixth had written in a very clear encyclical uh, against those who were teaching in the 60s in seminaries that it was a change of symbol. Hmm. I don't know if you had come across that. It was called transignification. Interesting. Instead of transubstantiation. So the significance changed from bread to uh, body of Christ. That's not what we believe. And he made it clear that is not our faith. That is not Catholicism. Catholicism is the substance changes. And the miracle there is it's usually the opposite with people, right? Like we, we can change our accidents pretty easily. I can get a haircut or yeah, I can, yeah. you know, but my substance remains the same. I'm still just Tim. Yeah. With the accident staying the same, yeah, what it is uh, yeah. has changed. And uh, right. yeah. Well, we have another caller. Hello, Mary. Hi, Father Mitch. You're calling from New Jersey, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> Great. And what is your question? Um, well, I, first, let me say that I'm enjoying this uh, uh, topic very much so. Uh, and uh, I'm enjoying it, Tim. Uh, I love all that he is saying. It's wonderful. Thank you, um, Mary. My question is about the time given at Mass after receiving communion mm -hmm. to to commune with our lord to to be mm -hmm. in the prayerful state uh as he is in us at, after receiving communion it's not often given it's kind of rushed at the end of mass um and uh it shouldn't be the case uh I'm, i keep thinking why doesn't the celebrant sit down and allow us, uh, and if, if necessary, even explain why that's important. You know, uh, if there's a lot of um, people 
thinking that uh, the, the uh, Eucharist is a symbol, and these are people who are actually going to Mass. Uh, mass is the best place for them to be instructed. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I'm so happy you're talking about this, uh, about the Eucharist. Um, Tim, I'd love to see if you get a show on EWTN. You're delightful. Um, and I'll just so, tell father every so week. So that's my question. My question is, uh, why not allow more time? The celebrant should sit down and, while the congregation communes with our Lord. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. A memory comes to mind. I went to Franciscan University of Steubenville for college. I remember when I got there, uh, Mass would end. They'd have the closing hymn. It'd be this noon Mass. It's packed. You're shoulder to shoulder. You know, hundreds of people come to Mass there. And so immediately, you know, they sort of make their way out, uh, the procession out of church. And I kind of turn to leave the pew, and everyone around me just hits their knees, you know. And it was instructive. Like, honestly, there was a, that taught me as much about the reality of what had just happened there as almost, you know, anything else. And it became a habit over time, where that time after Mass became Thanksgiving. So it's these kind of things um, that I think do help us, right? Yeah, having more time for reflection. Father Mike Scanlon, when I was at the university, used to always say, you know, let us pause for a second in Eucharistic amazement, you know? And it was just one of those things yeah, to just yeah. remember, you know, like I, it, these um, postures and these times and these moments are instructive. So yeah, amen. More time to just pray quietly after communion. I'm, I'm with you, Mary. I'll sign that petition. Yeah, okay. And, you know, this would be something... Um, uh, I think as we have these meetings, uh, again, next year, ne uh, uh, in June of 23? Yes. Yeah, in June of, uh, of 2023, uh, there'll be this parish preparation. Correct, right, yeah. Mary and others of you in our audience, that would be a great time to bring it up to your parish to ask for that time. Um, you know, and, and, and ways of expressing Christ is in my heart right now. I need a little time with him. So that would be a good thing. We have a, another caller. Hello, Kathy. Yes. Hello, Father. Hi. Hi. You calling from Massachusetts? Yes. Great. And what is your question? Well, uh, my question is that I live in assisted living Mm -hmm. I've been a mass goer for years, going daily mass, and I've fallen in love with the Eucharist and in Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there just isn't enough time or enough priests to fill the need in assisted living facilities for mm -hmm. seniors that long for the Eucharist. And yeah. the, my question is, Will anything like that be brought up at that um, mm. Eucharistic revival? Thank you, Kathy. That's a great question. What about, you know, getting the Blessed Sacrament to more people in assisted living places? Many of them cannot drive, and they don't have a means of transportation to get to Mass even on Sundays for many of them. Is this going to be part of, or maybe something you can bring up? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to bring that as a, as a you know, key thing to reflect on as we start to talk to dioceses and parishes about what are, what are the contours of this year. I, I think there's a really good point there where maybe that's almost this concept of Eucharistic missionaries that we've talked about. I hope that many more people sort of feel like uh, if I've allowed the Lord to change my life and my heart, um, then how can, I, how can I bring him into others? In that, in that case, you know, physically, um, how can I be part of that moment? It, yeah, it, 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 uh, it, it's touching um, to hear, you know, sort of her reflection on that and that, that longing there. And yeah, I guess if we have a, a minute where we're being beamed out to a lot of different people, just a, a call for, for more of that. I'm kind of convicted in my own life. Maybe I need mm -hmm. to, you know, do more of that um, myself. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, this is where uh, many of the deacons, some of whom already are working very hard, but, you know, for some of the deacons um, and uh, the Eucharistic ministers, the extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist to, you know, come up. I, I, certainly as I travel around, I, 
come up on people who are doing that, but this may need to be more organized. I'm one of the baby boomers, and we're this big bulge in the population, and now we're going to assisted living uh, situations. We're moving up in age. So uh, this is a very important uh, component of helping people to be ready for that. Yeah, I have to imagine that's something God would love to see more of, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially, you know, as we get older, we have a little bit more nervousness. We're getting closer to meeting Jesus. And so we want to be a little bit better prepared. <laughs> All right, let's go to Chuck in New Jersey. Chuck, what can we do for you, sir? Yeah, Father, I have a comment. Uh, I was just wondering uh, what you think about the communion in the uh, hand versus communion on the tongue. In, is Communion on the tongue seems so much more reverent. Mm -hmm. uh, and would, would it not lead to more belief in the real presence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll listen to your comment. Thank you, Chuck. Very good, good question. I'll let you. I think he was. Oh, okay. Well, I thought you said father. So I wanted, he did, uh, but I was going to give you oh, okay. a chance. You're the guest here today. I can comment later. Yeah, I receive on the tongue mm -hmm. myself. I, that's that's a, a choice that I've made that um, that has has always been kind of for the for the last probably decade or so. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Yeah. What are your thoughts? You know, I I, I would say this. Um, the option is given to us so that we can receive the most reverent way. Now, I can, again, hold enough to remember the arguments that went on in the late 60s and early 70s in favor of receiving in the hand. And some of them were very bad arguments. They were along the lines of, hey, I'm an adult. I can feed myself. I don't need someone else to feed me. The problem with that mentality is that you are saying, I feed myself. You're starting to sound that you want this to fit a certain Pelagian mentality. I do it myself. Whereas whether you receive in the hand, and I, I come, most of the people I meet receive very reverently Amen. in the hand. Yeah. Same, yeah. They really do. Yeah. You know, people are not being irreverent. Um, but there was this attitude that I can, I, I should be able to feed myself. And, you know, this is a gift, whether you receive it in the hand or receive it on the tongue. And I think for us, no matter how you receive, because you have the option, um, but to choose the option that helps you to be more reverent as you receive our Lord. I don't take Jesus. I've had some people, uh, especially folks who looked like they were young back in the 1970s <laughs> and no longer are young, and they want to take it from you. That's not right. You receive. You don't take. And it's not yours to grab. It's yours to receive and to receive reverently. Uh, it's Jesus Christ you're getting, not a symbol. And, you know, I'm by ritual in the Maronite rite. Oh. And we receive on the tongue as the norm because we receive by intinction. Sure. We take the body of Christ and dip it into the precious blood and, we, and put place it on the tongue. But because of COVID, the bishops have given permission for those who have various reasons to fear um, you know, that even that kind of contact um, to receive it in the hand. But normally we receive it uh, on the tongue. And, and it is very reverent, but it, for us it's normal. It's normal. That's a great answer, Father. Thank you. We have Lena calling from New York. What can we do for you, Lena? Well, I have been in the battle here because my sister left the faith about 40 years ago. Mm. And I have been studying this scripture for, I'm 87, and I'm still studying this scripture. Good for you. As the Lord says, my body is real food and my blood is real drink. Well, what does real mean to you? It's got to mean it's his, a real, real food, bread, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. real uh, blood, wine. But then he goes on to say, 
This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my Father. Is it a gift from God that we could believe this? Or, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I know I'm no better than anybody else, but how come I can believe it? And I had a friend who said, yep, the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, I don't want to drink that. Yeah. And so is it from the Father? Because I've been rebuked several times, and people say, no, you're no better than anybody else. He wouldn't say that. But yeah. they're bringing condemnation upon ourselves against the body and blood of Jesus if we do it in an unworthy manner, not recognizing the body and blood of Jesus. This is very important to me. Abs- and it means no, it's- you're absolutely right. Um, do, you, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I remember a few years ago, I got really interested in this idea of faith. Like, what is faith, you mm-hmm. know, and this cooperation between sort of our openness to the gift and then God bestowing the gift and the ability almost um, to believe because of the experience of seeing people who really struggled with it. And there's a big difference between, you know, obstinate doubt where I, you know, no matter what I see, I will not, you know, and and just struggles with, you know, faith and genuine sort of like wrestlings and um, there's a great, you know, there's some great resources. Frank J. Sheed has some great stuff. Yes. Lumen Fidei is a really excellent resource. It's mm-hmm. a, an encyclical from Pope Francis on this topic. Mm-hmm. And the idea is that faith is always a gift mm-hmm. um, at the end of the day. It's one of the theological virtues, which means it is bestowed. And there's ways that we can avail ourselves and open ourselves, you know, up to the possibility of that. So I, my, my advice would be, you know, um, keep at it, keep trying, you know. Yeah, we... We can present the faith, but we can't get anybody to believe. I don't, I've never converted a single soul in my life. The only one who can convert souls is God, our Lord. He gives that grace to convert them. I give the reasons to believe, but he does the converting. And I think that is absolutely essential. And you're right. No, this is what our Lord taught. Uh, the, about the real presence. And you just happen to know people that our Lord knew. They walked away from believing Jesus. And we keep wanting to bring them back, but he's going to have to sort that out himself. You know, we're running out of time, I'm afraid. Um, thank you very much for being with us, Tim. And again, if you want more information, go to Eucharistic revival.org. Join us this coming Sunday for the Eucharistic procession that we'll televise. And in many of your parishes and dioceses, join the Eucharistic uh, processions they have. And may the Lord bless you all and draw you ever closer to our Eucharistic Lord. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We can bring you this and all our programs and the Corpus Christi celebrations this Sunday only because the network is brought to you by you by keeping us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. Thank you and God bless.